scout overview. All right, becoming an NFL scout man, way, well, is it harder? I guess harder, harder is a subjective term. Being an NFL scout, is, it's hard to become one because no one has ever really shown me this is how you do it. With an agent, it's an order process with prices that are locked in and time limits and rules and all those kind of things. Being an NFL scout, there's nothing like that. It's almost all your network and, and who you know and being in the right place and having the right friends or having your dad play with someone or whatever. So, but first let's talk just a little bit about scouting in general. Y'all may know there's two kinds of scouts, pro and college. If you're a pro scout, you're watching NFL players. You may be watching arena league players, you may be watching CFL players, but mainly you're walk, watching guys that are no longer in college. That's pro scout. There are far fewer of those than there are college scouts. Typically a team's gonna have about eight Nine to ten, maybe eight college scouts that are canceling the country, and they have three or four pro scouts that do nothing but watch film of players that are already in the league that might get cut, that have been injured or whatever that they might want to trade for at some point. That's all they're doing is watching guys that are already in the league. They're already professionals. Most scouts now, but this is a 2014 number, but when we counted it, it was about 70 percent have been on the job less than 10 years, and that's because when you're an NFL team, the the perception is, whether it's right or wrong, I kind of think it's wrong, scouts are replaceable. And you can find someone that's just going to watch games and be about as good as anybody else at any time. So you give a guy three years, and when he's about to start making real money, you get rid of him because you can find someone else to do it. And you've always got a scouting assistant or an intern who's coming up, ready to replenish that person who was already there. And if you haven't seen enough from a scout, to feel like he's on a GM track, he could be a guy that's going to be a director for you someday, who's really going to be making big decisions and be on ESPN and all that kind of stuff. You get rid of him before he makes your own money. So it's really hard. You're almost imminently disposable as a scout. And the longer you're in, sometimes the harder it is to stay in because, again, you start to make more money, you start to be seen as a guy who's going to be hard to get rid of down the line, so you kind of, so they try to ditch him before they are more troubled than they're worth. Most scouts you get a three-year trial period, as I, as I mentioned, and you're starting out around 50 or 60. That's a lot better than it was a few years ago. But if you want to make 100, you've got to stay in about 10 years, and usually you've got to change teams at least once and sometimes twice. And being able to stay in the league depends almost directly on how well you know the people around you and how well you can network, because if you get cut by one team, you want to know someone on another team who can get you in there. It's very, very, it's just fraught with risk, and uncertainty, and it's an awesome job to have if you can stay employed, but it's harder than ever to stay employed these days. All right, so let's talk a little bit about where most scouts come from these days. It's kind of becoming more common for them to have sports management degrees, so if you're interested in being a scout, you're off to a good start. There is a perception out there that you can go to one of these scouting schools, and there's, they're all over the net, and you can pay X amount and take all these classes online and maybe get them a phone call or something and ask people about it, and that's gonna help you be a scout. And some of them even talk about, oh, look at all these scouts we got hired. The truth is, almost every time they got a scout hired, that person came into their scouting school with a network. Maybe he was an arena guy. Maybe he played in the league. Maybe his dad is a coach in the NFL. Maybe it's all of the above. But they, and they just wanted to come in and kind of improve their chances or be able to state their case in a more solid way with an NFL team. I don't believe that going in and spending money with those organizations, all respect to them, some of them are my friends, is going to get you any closer to being a scout if that's something you're inclined to do. Most are just hired because they know somebody. I mean, <laughs> about five years ago, I was thinking I would start up one of these little scouting schools and I called a friend of mine who was working for a NFL team, and I said, hey man, uh, so how do y'all hire scouts? I mean, what are y'all looking for? What do y'all do? And you know what he said to me? Well, you got somebody? That's how everybody operates. If, you're, if you want to be a scout, you find someone that calls someone, or you already know somebody. It's all, it's all network. It's all the old boy network. It's all that. It's very rarely, this guy was a awesome player, and he's shown acumen and evaluation, and he's willing to run through walls for us, and so we're going to hire him. 
Usually it's, well, the honors kid really wants to be a scout, so we're going to make him a scouting assistant. And sometimes I'll bring in like 10 or 11 guys, and they only keep one or two. So the odds are really tough. It's really hard to do. It's not impossible, but it's really hard to be a scout. I know I want to be one at one point, but that ship has sailed, and I'm kind of glad it has. It's a tough job, and it's really hard for me to get it out of it. Now, another little story. When I was, I don't know, 26, I found out that the Saints were my team. I'm a big Saints fan. The Saints had a job for a media intern. And at the time, I was working as a sports writer at a tiny newspaper in Beckley, West Virginia. And I knew someone, somehow, that had, was leaving the internship to go somewhere else, and they had an opening. So I called, and I thought, hey, man, I'm going to be this intern. And I, and I got all these credentials, and I really want to do it. And I was born in South Louisiana. And I've always been a Saints fan, or whatever, whatever. And I actually got as far down to be able to go and interview, and I had a house set up that I was going to live in and everything. I mean, I was already high. And so they called me and said, hey, man, sorry, we can't do it, but we have a business internship if you want to come in and sell tickets. And I think now about what if I had said yes. That was, they were going to pay me like a $500 a month stipend. I don't know how I would have lived. Um, I would have been basically cold calling people and working on commission, selling tickets for a team that really wasn't that good. And I, and I, and really I thought, I'm a media guy. I'm not going to fool with that. But if you want to cut your teeth and get inside the building, sometimes that's the way you have to do it. I can't emphasize enough getting inside the building. If you can just get a role with a team, then you can go, then it's so much easier to get an, uh, an introduction. You're, it's like you're, you've been made official when you get inside, somehow, no matter how. Even if you're sweeping floors, man. If you can get inside the building, you're halfway home, when, especially when it comes to this kind of stuff. Now. Most scouts have worked for teams for a few years. And we talked about scouting assistants and how tenuous that is before they actually attain a full-time job. And that's usually because they push down a guy who's getting older and you have to pay, and they want to hire you so they don't have to pay somebody. Any questions? All right. OK. So when, we, when ITL started in 02, it was easy to spot the scouts, because they were all like this, and they had a whole head of gray hair if they had any hair at all. All right? Most of the time, they were college coaches that had never made a head coach. Maybe they did, and they got fired, and they didn't want to recruit anymore. They just, and they had buddies that worked for NFL teams. And so they would get hired to come in for four or five years, maybe 10 years, get a pension, and kind of ride off into the football sunset, so to speak. And they knew people. They, they probably coached in one area of the country primarily, so they had a great network already. And they had friends that they could ask, and they would tell them the truth about players. And they had developed their eyes, so they knew talent. It was a good way to hire a scout. You had to pay them a little bit more, but it was worth it because you knew you were getting some return on your investment. Um, they were also, this is an important distinction, they were expected to come back and know who the players were in their area. Now, because the Patriots have been so successful, everyone wants to follow the Patriots model. And the Patriots model is go out and get hard measurables height, weight, 40 times if you can. Find out exactly what a guy's been arrested for. Find out the disposition of that arrest, what his arrest record is. Find out any, anything about suspensions. Find out anything about what the guys at the office say about it. But don't come back and tell us to be a player or, or not. We'll make that determination. So players are kind of going out and they're, they're almost like robots. And they're getting a certain amount of information, but they're not really coming back thinking. They're just bringing back numbers. And that's kind of the Patriots model. And that's why teams are paying scouts less and hiring younger guys because that's something that a lot of guys can do. You don't necessarily have to have an involved scouting eye to be able to do those kinds of things now. You're just kind of almost running errands for teams. Also, kind of funny, you've almost got a better chance with an economics degree or a finance degree than you do with a sports management degree because everyone's trying to figure out analytics. Everyone sees the analytics coming, and they think there's a magic answer to NFL scouting, and they're going to be able to punch in certain numbers, and then it's going to come out with a sheet that tells you what, which players can play. I'm kind of an old school guy. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but that's the mindset right now with NFL teams. So they're looking for guys that are math wizards, which I certainly love. It. So just another observation I made over the last few years. And we also talked about how the longer you're in, if you or a hot shot, and you look like a guy that's really going to be management someday, they'll keep you. Otherwise, they're pretty much going to turn you loose. 
all of my scouts, or most of my scouts that are doing reports for me now, uh, an agent calls in and he wants us to do a report. Those guys mostly were are guys that are in their third, late 30s, early 40s, that a team said, well, I don't think we're gonna make this guy a GM, we're gonna get rid of him, and you know, and then we'll go find someone else young who maybe will be a GM someday. And they're all, they were all on the road long enough to really know what they're doing and make some contacts and, and build a network, but they weren't seen as guys that are gonna be superstars, so now they're on the street, so now they're kind of working with me. All right, so let's, let's go through the year of the scout. Start off with mini camps. A lot of people think, oh, well, if I'm a scout, I'm going on the road and, meet and, and looking at schools and stuff. They do a lot of evaluation of their own players because they got to know what the team, their own team needs. So they'll start off and they'll go to mini camp and OTAs. They'll also go to Bluestone National, and this is probably a little beyond the scope of what we're going to do, but let me talk briefly about Bluestone National. Two thirds of NFL teams subscribe to one of two services that essentially do the advanced scouting of college players for them. They're looking at the juniors while the NFL teams look at the seniors. So that when they get to the spring and they're getting ready to go into fall, they're given a list of the, and these two services, Blesto and National, say, okay, these are the guys we think are gonna be the players that will be drafted. These are guys who are gonna first round, second, third, whatever. And it's just kind of a primer for an NFL team so they can go in saying, okay, this is what, these are the guys we need to be looking at. Now, they will, as they go through the season, those guys will get hurt, they won't play well, whatever, others will come up, will, will do better, and they'll kind of tear up those sheets, but at least they have a start, an introduction to which players are gonna to be top ones. Okay, and then May is when, also, when the most turnover takes place in scouting departments. There's, we'll have a pretty hot Twitter account in May because there'll be a lot of scouts getting hired, fired, whatever, all my, all my, Friends in scouting right now are texting me like every day, hey man, what are you hearing? Who's gonna have a job? Who's gonna get fired? They wanna know what their buddies, what's gonna happen to their buddies, they wanna know what's gonna happen to them. Every day I'll send out a text that's this long to my guys and say, okay, here's everything that I heard. Here's what's hot. Here's what I think is gonna happen. Here's what I'm speculating might happen. Here's what I know is gonna happen. And it just goes around like that. I know they forward it around and stuff because everybody wants to know if they're gonna get fired or if their buddies gonna get fired. All right, so June is OTAs and camps. Then vacations start in late June. July is when most teams are on vacation, nothing's happening really. There is a supplemental draft, which isn't a big deal. August is when scouts actually start going out. And the thing about it is if you want to be a scout, guys, it's important to know, these guys are on the road 11 months out of the year, pretty much. They're driving through the night sometimes to get to a school. They get to the school, sometimes they gotta get there at six in the morning because you wanna get in ahead of the other guys so that you, you're the one that's got the clicker and you can watch the film the way you wanna watch it. Then you get home, you might get home, when I say home, back to a hotel room at six o'clock in the evening, you gotta write up, let's say you went to Auburn that day or Alabama or whatever. You got six or seven, maybe eight or nine guys you gotta write up reports before you go to bed. And those are detailed reports off the notes that you wrote, you have spoken to, to coaches at, at the school, you've done all these things and now, you've got to start writing, you can kind of put it all on paper, and then you got to turn it in. And then you got to get up in the morning, or maybe even that night, and drive to the next school. It's a tough job, and it never ends. And from really August until November, maybe December, that's all scouts are doing is driving around and going to games and writing these reports. And people think of scouting as this glamorous thing where it's like real time, Real life fantasy football, and you get to make all these decisions and change people's lives. You're like a kingmaker, and you got to use all these buzzwords and Mel Kiper Jr. and Tom McShay use and all that. That's nothing like what a scout does. It's a lot of long, lonely drives. It's a lot of late nights. It's a lot of being told by some young, young coach that he doesn't know what he's doing, that you don't know what you're doing because you're not identifying the right team. Some schools hate scouts. Penn State, Vanderbilt not scout friendly at all. And so it just, these are the kind of things that make the job hard. Is it fun when you get to see a player that you identified, that you evaluated, that you liked, go and rise and start in the NFL? Yeah, that's incredible. But there's a lot more of the late nights and the long drives and all those kind of things. I just want y'all to know that that's something you're really serious about. So anyway, road work continues in September, October. We're going around looking at players, you're cross-checking, you're evaluating other, other sometimes, Teams will send a scout to a different area to cross-check the players that the first scout kind of liked. 
November is when National Bless will kind of have their after the season meeting around Thanksgiving. They talk about the players that they that kind of rose up that they didn't have in the meetings going into the season. And then you really start putting your board together. December is when college bowl season begins, obviously. Those are pretty much scoured by teams. All-star games in January, that's a busy time for me. The Senior Bowl is the number one all-star game. It's played third week in January. The Shrine game is probably number two. It's the week before. It's also the week the NFLPA Collegiate Bowl is played out in Los Angeles. They play head-to-head -head because they hate each other and they're trying to knock each other out. Our game is the first weekend in, Dow first weekend in January. Again, in Fort Worth this year coming up. After that, I'm not sure. But that's the really busy time for All-Star Games. And all these seniors are calling and hoping that they'll get an All-Star Game invite, all those kind of things. And then they go and they play, hope they don't get hurt, hope they can help themselves. February is when the combine is. March is for pro days. April is for the draft. Some teams will have on-site pro, pro days for local players. It's called a local pro day. They're putting their board together. They're doing all those kind of things. 